Right, so um, participants are just joining, I can see, so I'll just give a few minutes to enable people to uh, join us. Good morning, everybody. We'll get started in just a couple of minutes. We're just giving a minute or two to let people join us. Fantastic. So we've got uh, almost 50 people, well, 50 people now joined. So I will get started in a, just a sec. Morning. Yes, uh, feel free, uh, those of you that have joined already, uh, let us know where you are, if you, if you wouldn't mind. That would be fantastic to find out where people are joining us from. But I will go ahead and get started now. So welcome, everybody. We're really pleased to have you join us uh, today to mark World Diabetes Day. My name is Caroline Gillett. I'm the Community and Public Engagement Manager for both the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research and also the Centre for Systems Modelling and Quantitative Biomedicine two research centres based at the University of Birmingham and we're, we're passionate about uh, including lived experience uh, voices and perspectives in what we do and we're also very very committed to public engagement so uh, today's event is part of that enabling you to engage with the research that we're doing. So I'm really pleased that uh, we're, we've been able to partner today with Diabetes UK and I'd like to give a sh uh, shout out sorry to Faye Riley, who's been working with me behind the scenes to coordinate today's event. So I think Faye may be in the audience today, in which case, hello Faye and, and thank you. Um, almost all of us will know somebody in our lives who is affected by diabetes. And so we really thought it would be a great opportunity to uh, enable you to find out a little bit more about what research is actually being done. So we don't necessarily know a lot about the research that's being done, but almost all, all, all of us will know somebody who is affected by it. Um, so today's event aims to introduce you to some of our researchers. I'm not going to say too much because I'm going to, they're going to introduce themselves shortly. But uh, I just wanted to say in terms of how things will run today, we'll have a short number of talks to begin with. They'll only be sort of five minutes each. And then we'll take a short comfort break and then we'll go into the panel discussion, which is the point that you've got to ask our panelists questions. Uh, thank you in advance to those of you who've already, who have already submitted questions. We've compiled those and we'll try to get through as many of them as we possibly can. But of course, uh, having you here with us live today means it's a great opportunity for you to also pop in questions live. Um, in terms of how things work on Zoom, so hopefully you're familiar with Zoom, but if not, uh, there's a general chat function, so if you just want to tell us where you are or say hello to the other at attendees, then just use the general chat for that. However, if you've got a question for our panel during the panel discussion, please use the Q&A function um, rather than the chat, because it just makes it a lot easier for us to monitor the questions and address them. Uh, one final thing I wanted to say was uh, we'd really value your feedback and so at the end of this I will just be sharing a short uh, feedback survey which takes literally only about two minutes to complete so I'll pop that in the chat towards the end of the event and we'd really really value and appreciate if you could uh, fill that out for us. Um, a few of you have asked about certificates of uh, attendance and if you'd like one of those the way to get that is to fill out that feedback form and you should get one automatically off the back of that. So uh, without further ado it's my great pleasure to introduce you to David Adams who's the head of the medical and dental uh, college at the University of Birmingham who's going to uh, give a short welcome and um, uh, kick off. Thank you. Well, thanks very much Caroline um, and hello everybody. Uh, Welcome to, to virtual Birmingham. Uh, it's a shame we can't be together in person, although from looking at where the participants are signing in from, um, these webinars do give us a fantastic opportunity for people to join us from, from all over the world. So welcome, welcome everybody. Um, as Caroline says, I'm head of the College of Medical and Dental Sciences. Uh, I, I'm not actually, I am a clinician, but I'm not uh, a diabetologist. Uh, my area is liver disease, but it's been my huge pleasure and privilege over the last few years to chair the research committee for Diabetes UK uh, and that has given me a wonderful insight into some of the fantastic research which is going on uh, across the UK and one of the things that's really impressed me and I think this meeting today reinforces this uh, is the way that Diabetes UK works as a partnership 
uh, between people with diabetes uh, and researchers and clinicians. And this is really important. Uh, we need to involve um, patients and, and, and carers uh, in deciding what are the important questions that we need to be addressing uh, going forwards. And too, too frequently in the past, uh, scientists and researchers got locked into their, into their bubbles, but that is certainly not the case. Uh, with, with research into diabetes, either at the national level or, or particularly uh, in Birmingham. So I think there's a, there's a really interesting group of people involved today, um, and I'm really looking forward to, to hearing the, 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 the talks and the, and the, panel, the panel discussion. Uh, and I would just like to thank everybody for, 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 for joining today, the panelists in particular, for, for taking the time. Uh, and to Caroline and, and, and Faye for, for pulling this together and, and organising the, the, the meeting so well and so efficiently. So I look forward to hearing about um, research that matters, which is one of the strap lines of the university. It's important that we do do research that's, that matters and that's important. Uh, and I welcome you all once again uh, and hope you have a really productive uh, and enjoyable um, day. So thank you very much, Caroline, back to you. Many, thank Dave, uh, many thanks, David. Um, and we're going on to another David now, um, uh, Professor David Hodson, who's going to be today's chair and who um, is a really well-known uh, researcher within the field of diabetes and who does amazing work. So David, uh, please do introduce yourselves. Introduce, your, introduce yourself, sorry. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is David Hodson, as um, Caroline has introduced. I'm um, Professor of Diabetes um, I'm actually sat here in my bedroom at, at a makeup table on the world's smallest chair. So if you see me kind of moving around, it's because it's not the most comfortable place ever. Um, and you can see that the weather in Birmingham is grim as usual. I mean, the windows are fully open here and we're barely getting any light into the bedroom. So uh, you can sort of virtually see uh, what we've got to deal with here in the UK in terms of our weather. So I'd like to echo David's comments and thank you all for taking the time to attend this panel. I think it's going to be really interesting. It's the first time I've done anything like this and I've been looking forward to this um, all week. And we've got some really stellar people here uh, that can answer questions, including uh, patients themselves, so John Bridges. Um, so a little bit about my background. I um, actually used to work in, in, in reproductive biology, but then I made the shift to diabetes um, about a decade ago. And I've been funded by Diabetes UK ever since really. So it's Diabetes UK's fault. Uh, that we do the work that we do because I was funded as an RD Lawrence Fellow uh, subsequently to taking uh, a position at Birmingham uh, where I then sort of received a, a little bit more funding from them. So I'm very grateful to Diabetes UK and really uh, everything that we do in the lab um, has really strong foundations um, from the charity. So um, I think I'm going to pass you over to, is it Vika now, Caroline? I think it's you, uh, David. So I think oh, Vicky's going to join okay. during the panel. Cool. So Fine. you're going to so do. Do, 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 do uh, put some slides up then. Yeah, cool. Right. So so I think as you'll see, um, we we like making pretty images, but I'm just going to give you an overview about what. Uh, the University of Birmingham does in terms of diabetes and particularly the Institute uh, which I'm affiliated with which is the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research. Um, so I'm currently the theme lead there and, and deputy director and um, since I moved to Birmingham five years ago the diabetes research has really kind of um, sort of developed um, to the point now where um, I think we're becoming pretty good at it in, in an unbiased manner. Um, but sort of from my personal background I don't have diabetes myself, um, but both my parents have uh, type two diabetes. So uh, my mum was diagnosed with gestational diabetes uh, shortly after I was born. Uh, and my dad has had type two diabetes for 30 years now, and he's insulin dependent uh, at this moment. So it kind of affects the family. And it's something that I'm, I'm very um, passionate um, about. So it's really good to sort of be able to share um, the motivation behind why we do um, the work that we do. So, um, I mean, if we look at the UK, uh, diabetes is, is important. I mean, these are two snapshots here, um, about five years apart. And you'll see that um, over the, the, the last five years, um, the prescriptions per person, which is kind of a good idea about the prevalence of the disease, has increased uh, 
quite uh, dramatically. Uh, and this is a common theme around the world that rates of diabetes are increasing. Uh, and this is for various um, reasons. There is good news. We're getting better at treating diabetes and better at diagnosing diabetes. So this is not necessarily a bad thing, but it's something to be aware of and a reason why we still need to fund important research because we don't really understand um, enough about the basic uh, and clinical uh, side of diabetes at the moment, because if we did, we'd be able to halt this um, increase. So Birmingham in particular has amongst the highest rates of diabetes in the UK. So you can see here, this is the West Midlands. Uh, it's a beautiful part of the country. For those of you from, from overseas, I would recommend you come to visit Birmingham. It's well known for its outstanding natural beauty. And this is Leicester here, um, which also has very high rates of diabetes. And th there's many reasons for this. It's because we have um, slightly higher um, rates of obesity than normal, but also we have um, quite a diverse population as well, which drives um, genetic susceptibility. And we just have a large population in general. So at the Institute, um, this is pretty much everybody uh, involved in the research. And, and what you'll notice is, um, apart from me, who's uh, slightly older and, and gray haired, these are all very young people that, that do the work. So the, the clinicians, it's terrifying now when I sort of go to hospital and, and it looks as though you're getting um, treated by one of your kids. Um, but David, sorry to interrupt. Your, your mic keeps dipping in and out. So I just wondered whether you could reposition it possibly. To yeah, I think it's an issue with my laptop, actually. I've had this problem before. Sorry, Caroline. No problem. Um, so um, the, the, these are the people that um, do all the research and, and they're very... Uh, young as you can see. So why Birmingham is, 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 is unique is, is uh, because of this picture here. So this is the Queen Elizabeth Hospital, which is one of the largest hospitals in the UK. And you have some uh, diabetes service located here. And you'll see connecting the Queen Elizabeth Hospital is the clinical research facility. So this is where a lot of the patient uh, trials and clinical trials will be conducted as well as just the human physiology work. And you'll see that we're then further connected with this uh, red building here called the IBR. And this is where all the basic research labs are uh, and the Institute is located. So we're very joined up in being able to deliver uh, both our basic and, and, and clinical work. And this is kind of how it goes. I mean, you need a healthy kind of tranche of funding to do this. So this is both from Diabetes UK and the government. And this allows us to join up our basic work uh, with translational work and modeling and clinical trials. And this is all helped by the uh, technologies uh, facility um, and importantly, the patients and public. So we don't do any work uh, at Birmingham, both uh, basic translational clinical and modeling without first consulting uh, with our stakeholders who are the patients. So I think on that note, I'm, I'm gonna um, leave this now uh, to Gabby and uh, John and Alessandro, who will uh, speak to you a little bit more about some of the, the, the work we do, but in a very nice, basic manner. So I'll hand over to you, Gabby. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Um, and good morning. My name is Gabby, and uh, I'm one of the diabetes researchers at the IMSR. So I'd like to thank everybody for the opportunity to talk a little bit about work that we're doing over here at uh, the University of Birmingham. Like David, I'm sitting in my bedroom. In fact, I'm just across the road from him. And like David, I am interested in diabetes because um, my family is heavily affected by the, the, the disease, including myself. So there's a personal interest in doing the work that we do. So to lay the ground a little bit, I would like to talk to you a little bit about how we as scientists in doing basic research see diabetes. So let me share my screen. So um, diabetes is a condition that is characterized by poor control of blood glucose content. Uh, glucose is a sugar, which is one of the fuel types that is used by the body. To understand how control of blood glucose is lost, we first need to know what happens in health. So how is blood glucose content controlled normally? So the amount of glucose in the body is tightly controlled as having too much glucose in the blood leads to Sorry, diabetes. Have Sorry, Gabby, have you shared your slides yet? I, I have. Oh, uh, no, I can't see just... them. I don't know whether anybody else can. Okay, let me just try again. Ah, uh, let's see. There we go. Is that better? 
Let's say start to selection. Okay, okay. Hey, go for that. So, so the amount of blood glucose uh, is tightly controlled as uh, having too much glucose in the blood leads to diabetes. Blood glucose levels are controlled by the hormone insulin. Insulin is produced in and released from special cells in the pancreas where blood glucose is high, for example, after a meal. Insulin travels from the pancreas to other tissues, leading to uh, increased uptake of glucose into these tissues and stopping the release of stored fuel. This leads to lowered glucose in the blood, and we know that obesity and diabetes are linked. For example, hormones called incretins that are released from the gut in response to feeding controls the function of the insulin producing cells and also the function of the neurons in the brain that control energy balance. The brain also controls insulin release. So there's a fair amount of inter-organ communication that leads to the control of glucose and energy balance. So what happens in diabetes? When the tissues stop responding to insulin, this condition is termed insulin resistance. Glucose starts to uh, accumulate in the blood and the pancreas keeps releasing insulin due to this high blood glucose content. The, specials in the special cells in the pancreas that make and release insulin become stressed and from this high workload and die. These special cells are not significantly uh, replaced after birth. So what we're born with is essentially what we've got to last us throughout our lives. Uh, even when they're faced with damage, they're not really replaced. So over time, when enough of these insulin producing cells have died, the patient gets frank diabetes. There's also evidence from my own work and that of others that certain genetic variations may predispose people in the population with, uh, with these variations to diabetes by making them less responsive to the gut hormones that control energy balance via the brain and the pancreas. There is currently no cure for diabetes. We can use medication to counter some of the effects of the disease by making the tissues like muscle, fat, and liver more sensitive to insulin or by trying to maintain sufficient function of the insulin producing cells. So we need to understand the science behind all these modes of normal control of energy balance in order to solve the problem of diabetes. Diabetes researchers at the IMSR study all these aspects of the control of blood glucose working as a team with the aim of developing more effective therapies for the treatment of diabetes. I will try to tell you a little bit about what we do in the labs in the following slide. So uh, you've met our theme lead, David Hodson. Uh, David is an islet biologist. Islets are special spherical groupings of cells, which look a bit like this. That, and they are scattered throughout the, uh, the pancreas and make up about 1% of the pancreas. So these cells are extremely rare and they're very special because they have very specific functions. So all these uh, different colored spheres in this islet here are special cells which are all involved in the control of blood glucose levels. The most abundant islet cell type are the green ones, uh, which make insulin. Uh, and we, when we lose a large number of these uh, insulin producing cells, we get diabetes. David's work centers on these insulin producing cells. So he's trying to figure out how they work, how we can use drugs to treat them in diabetes and keep them alive. The cells that make insulin are very rare and are not replenished when they're damaged. So my colleague, Dr. Ildem Ackerman, is interested in what makes an insulin producing cell so special. How are these cells made in the body? And can we make these cells in a dish so that we can replenish insulin producing cells via an external source? The problem Ildem is trying to solve is how do we go from a progenitor cell? So this is a cell that is programmable to become another cell type, just like what happens when in the embryo, to one of these green cells, these insulin producing cells. We know that this process is controlled by the activity of the genome. So Ildem is trying to figure out how we can manipulate the genome to make an insulin producing cell. And she recently received a prestigious fellowship award from the Diabetes UK to conduct this work over the next five years. Professor Gareth Lavery is an expert in muscle biology. I have mentioned earlier that when blood glucose levels rise, the pancreas releases insulin and the insulin travels to target tissues such as muscle and causes glucose to be taken up into the muscle. The ability of muscle to respond to insulin and to take up glucose is dependent on the health of the muscle cells. The health of the muscle cells can be affected by our diet, how much exercise we do, and by aging, all of which are also contributing factors for diabetes. Some of the drugs that are used to treat diabetes work through effects on muscle. Gareth's work focuses on how muscle cells change, how they work in response to insults and to drugs, which will help us design better drugs to treat diabetes. So 
what do I do? I worked for many years as an islet biologist like David, but over the years I have become more interested in the communication that occurs between tissues to coordinate blood glucose and fuel balance. Communication occurs via few sensors that are present in all these tissues and is under the control of the body clock and our genes. So for example, some of the genes with variations that are uh, known to increase the risk of type 2 diabetes in the population are involved of some, in some of these intra-organ communications. What we do to one tissue, for example with a drug, may have knock-on effects elsewhere in the body, which may or may not be desirable. My job is to try to map these communication pathways and in doing this, understand how these tissues work together so that we can design better drugs with fewer knock-on side effects. And that's all for me. And I'm happy to take questions a little bit later on. Thank you, Gabby. I think I've just had a message from David Hodson that he's rebooting his computer to see whether he can get his mic to work better. So um, in the interest of uh, getting on with things, I'd like to introduce Jonathan Hazelhurst, who's going to talk a little bit more about how IMSR is looking at diabetes from a more sort of clinical angle. Jonathan, um, please do share your slides and we'll get started. Thank you. Okay. Okay, it doesn't want to let me to share at the moment. So just give me two seconds. Can you see my screen? Hopefully. Yes, we can. So you just need to uh, pop it into screen uh, share mode. Sorry, uh, presenter mode. Hopefully you can see that. Great. Okay. Um, okay, so hello, everybody. Thanks for joining today. Uh, my name is... Yeah. No, sorry, go, go John, it's, it's working now, thank you. Great, okay. Yeah, thanks very much for joining today. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to talk to you some 99 years or so after the, uh, after the discovery of insulin. Um, so my name's John Hazelhurst and I'm a clinical doctor in diabetes, endocrinology and obesity, as well as a, a clinical academic working across those fields. And you've seen this picture already today, and I just want to make the point that really the IMSR is a big organization, and it's really important that we all work together fairly effectively and efficiently. Here's little old me, and clearly I'm just a relatively small cog in what is a fairly well-oiled and efficient machine. Now, if on the next graphic, I circled everybody that I have worked with and do work with and plan to work with, near enough, everyone in that diagram would be circled. Some of the work I'm going to talk to you about today is some things I work on, as well as a few other things that some of my colleagues work on. And clinically, clearly in an organisation as large as the IMSR, the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research, we work across a number of different themes, both in different types of diabetes, as well as in children and adults. Some of our current interests, particularly around sleep, the role of exercise, particularly in type 1 diabetes, some of my own interests around obesity, particularly about how adipose tissue works and about uh, obesity healthcare delivery. And more recently, my interests have extended into the treatment and management of some gestational diabetes, which I'm going to talk to you about in just a moment. But actually, although clearly we do lots of very clinically focused work, a lot of what we do goes beyond. Oops, one second, sorry, I'm just having a minor technical problem. A lot of what we do beyond uh, both the laboratory and the clinic, because clearly all of the research that we undertake has to be deliverable. And as part of that, we work very actively in patient empowerment and engagement. We work across multiple different policy areas. And clearly, very importantly, we work in the education and training of the next generation, both in clinicians, clinical and clinical academics and beyond. And that's why we have a fairly cohesive theme of work pulling together to try and improve patient care. So one of the things I've more recently started working on is the area of gestational diabetes. Now, I think you've already heard a couple of mentions of gestational diabetes, and that's not a surprise, actually, because it's, it's very, very common. And what gestational diabetes means is it's pregnancy associated, associated diabetes. So diabetes occurring in pregnancy that would most typically resolve after delivery. And this affects some 16 million women in the world a year. And this is a number that develop gestational diabetes. But unfortunately, there can be complications both to the mother and the offspring of gestational diabetes. And these can be classed as both short and long-term complications. 
For example, mothers are at significantly increased risk of developing long-term type 2 diabetes. And I think you've already heard uh, personal experience of that in some of David's comments. And actually the offspring of women with gestational diabetes are at short-term risks, as well as very interestingly, the long-term risk of developing obesity as adults. And some of the questions that I've become increasingly interested in are around about interventions and whether we can prevent gestational diabetes and also whether or not we can identify who are most at risk of developing complications. Uh, and by this, I particularly focus now on type 2 diabetes. So when we approach a topic like, for example, can we prevent diabetes? One option is we can do a brand new study. And clearly that can be very attractive and very powerful. We can study a particular intervention, a particular population, etc. But particularly in some clinical areas with very clinically focused questions, many studies have already been done. So one such possibility is to combine these studies in a particular type of research called systematic reviews, and that can give us increased power to answer very clinically focused questions. But actually, what's even more powerful is rather than just working with the data from those studies, is working with the authors and the researchers in those studies in a collaborative manner such that they'll share with us the data around individual people within those studies. And by working very collaboratively with people across the world, we can answer these really targeted, very important clinical questions by actually using existing research. And one of the projects that I'm embedded in at the moment is a project looking at the prevention of gestational diabetes. And by working with colleagues from across the world, we've got the individual level data on more than 20,000 people from 50 different studies, approximately from about 30 different countries. And you can see that's an enormously powerful way to use existing data to answer really important clinical questions that can't be, ident can't be easily answered by small studies alone. Actually, although we're very interested in this type of question and many, many others, and, you know, we work as researchers, as healthcare providers, you know, the role of administrators is crucial. And clearly the role of the funders is very important because without that funding, you know, none of this is possible. Central to all of this, as many of us have said, is people with diabetes. And that can sometimes extend to patients, families and carers. And I just want to end very briefly on the comment. Um, this comment here, uh, nothing about me without me. And that's why events like this are so very important so that, so that you know, we can be directly informed by uh, people living with diabetes experiences to help drive and shape some of our research and some of our goal setting and research areas. So thank you very much indeed. I will stop sharing now and I look forward to answering some general questions later on. Many thanks, Jonathan. Um, I'm not sure whether David Hodgson's back, um, yes or not. I think, uh, I think, you... um, is, is, is that better? I've, I've just got rid of the yes. headset. Uh, Perfect. Yeah, just one of the many issues with, with the new virtual world is you're reliant on your equipment and your internet connection, and also your children and your cats not to break into the bedroom. So uh, we've got Elizabeth Robertson next, uh, David, and then we'll, we'll go yeah, into that. Perfect. Uh, so we just need Jonathan Hazelhurst to stop sharing, if that's okay, John. Hi, if you want to start sharing my screen. Yes. Yeah. Okay, I'll try to do that. Let me know when you see it. Yeah, if you just put it into uh, PowerPoint mode. Yeah, can you see that? Yes, perfect, thank you. Great. So, hi everybody, I'm uh, Elizabeth Robertson. I'm the Director of Research at Diabetes UK and I'm, I'm absolutely thrilled to be here, um, well, virtually here in, in Birmingham with all of you today. And I'm really grateful to Caroline and all of you for inviting me and for, for doing this on World Diabetes Day. It's, it's fantastic. And you can see there's so many people joining from, from all over the world, which is amazing. And again, a real advantage of this type of platform. So I'm just going to give you um, a quick uh, overview of how we support research and what, what are the, the, what's our approach to that. Um, hopefully you'll find some, some areas of interest. So as a charity, we've been around for 80 years and uh, we're really ambitious. We, we've got two, two key goals really in the long term. One is for the, the 4.8 million people in the UK and people around the world. We want people to live well and we want people to live longer with diabetes. 
but also we want to be part of the global effort to find cures and preventative strategies for all the different types of diabetes. So that's really at the heart and that's really what, what drives our charity. In the next five years, we've identified five outcomes which we're really, really passionate about moving forward on. And I'll just quickly take you through those. First of all, we want more people who are at risk or have, to have type two, type one, all forms of diabetes to benefit from new treatments that potentially can cure or prevent the condition. You know, this is really, really important. And we've heard some of the, the work that's going on in Birmingham towards that. We want more people to be in remission from type two diabetes. And again, that's, that's new work that is helping people to, to achieve that. Critically also, we want to make sure that people get the quality of care they need to manage their, their diabetes well. As we've just heard, we, there are many people who get gestational diabetes as well as type two. We want the fewer people to be developing these conditions. And really critically, we want more people to live well, better and more confident lives with diabetes uh, free from discrimination. So how are we going to continue to fund, support and enable this work? Well, I, I'm just going to summarise it in five areas. First of all, critically new ideas. We always need new ideas, new bright ideas of how we're going to do this. We see our role in the charity very much as a facilitator, bringing people together. And this is clinicians, scientists, critically people living with diabetes, but also healthcare professionals who are working day, day to day in, in giving that care. So how do we bring people together to really think and, and help us to make sure we're investing in the right areas? We are also really passionate about bringing the very best minds and people that want to spend their careers working in diabetes research, that's really critical. And finally, none of this is, is important unless we can translate that research into benefits for, for people and to do that faster. And of course, we can't do this on our own. So we always want to work in partnership with others. And I'm just now going to give you some examples of what we're doing in these five areas. So when we're talking about bringing new ideas into diabetes research, and I could have talked about any of the colleagues that have just previously spoken, but I'm going to talk, just mention another colleague here in Birmingham, uh, Dr. Partharendran, who's working on some really uh, cutting edge work, trying to stop the immune attack um, and potentially moving towards a future immunotherapy for type one, which is a really exciting area of research. Bringing people together, we do an awful lot of this. We bring workshops, we bring people together all the time to think about specific areas of diabetes and what the future holds, where are the gaps, where are the unmet needs. And this is one example where um, a couple of years ago, we brought people together from all over the world to think about the effect of people's mental well-being and diabetes research. And as a result of that, we funded some work uh, looking at, for example, eating disorders um, and how to support people through that with both type one and type two. It's also, as I mentioned, really important that this work gets translated into practice and that we make sure this, this work actually has impact. And again, a really current example of that that is um, to do with remission of type 2, where we funded a clinical trial um, looking at a low-calorie um, low diet and long-term weight management, which has helped a lot of people uh, to achieve remission. And the NHS in, in the UK, our, our National Health Service, is now rolling out a pilot to see if this can work in, in um, normal GP settings. So we're really pleased to see that starting to happen. So a really, really, really good example, I think, of tr rapid translation of research. And then research leaders of the future, and you've seen already Adam, who we're absolutely delighted that she's our new RD Lawrence Fellow here in Birmingham. Uh, and she's doing some really exciting cutting edge work uh, looking at developing insulin producing cells in the lab. And again, this could be another really exciting step forward to life changing uh, treatment. And partnership. We're all dealing with the pandemic at the moment, and we uh, have funded a number of, of pieces of work across the country in the UK, looking at uh, the relationship and the correlation between COVID and diabetes. And this is just one example where we've partnered with another charity in the UK called Fight for Sight, um, which uh, has helped uh, a colleague in Edinburgh who's going to be looking at imaging in the eye to see if that could be a non-invasive way of trying to predict a risk of developing um, COVID-19 in people with diabetes. 
So finally, I just wanted to say, I, you know, I'm delighted to be virtually here in Birmingham. It is, as you've seen, a real centre of excellence for diabetes research. I, vi I had the pleasure of vis visiting physically a while ago and got to see the excellent facilities. But also, I think what comes across really strongly is this sense of collaboration between uh, clinicians, researchers, but also people with diabetes to really make the most of the investment that us and other funders uh, fund, but, but also making sure that those um, uh, breakthroughs and those uh, changes in, in treatment practice, cure, prevention strategies happen much sooner. So I'll stop there just to thank, thank you. Thank you for attending today. None of this is possible without your support um, and, and also the collaborative approach of our researchers. Um, now more than ever, I think we're seeing that across the world. Um, and if you're interested in more about what we're doing, there's our website um, link there. And if you on Twitter, please do uh, follow me if, if you wish. And thank you again on World Diabetes Day. It's really fantastic to be part of uh, this uh, ongoing work in, in Birmingham, but also connecting across the world. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you so much, Elizabeth. So um, David, I think we're gonna take a short uh, comfort break now and then we'll reconvene as a panel um, in just a couple of minutes. Does that sound okay, everybody? Is David there? Uh, oh yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, 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 I'll, I'll see you all in three minutes of- uh... Cool. So everybody do take a, a break, take a moment to go grab yourself a drink, et cetera. And we'll be back in just uh, three, three, four minutes. So um, see you soon. Thank you, everybody.
Hi everybody, so we'll be getting started in just a few moments. Uh, so I'm going to hand over to David Hodson now, who will take the reins. So what we're going to do now is introduce um, some uh, new panellists. So we have uh, John Bridges. We're very lucky to have him here today. He's our patient representative with lived experience of diabetes. Uh, we have Patricia Thomas. She was an MRC Skills Development Fellow. And Trish uh, looks at um, how um, fats interact with uh, insulin release. Uh, we have Alessandro Prete, who's um, a clinician uh, funded by uh, Diabetes UK uh, for his PhD studies, and he's looking at um, a disease um, caused by um, the loss in function of the adrenal glands and, and how this can predispose to um, diabetes. And Vipka Alt, who is our head of institute, again, a, a clinician, uh, and Vika studies um, PCOS, so polycystic ovarian syndrome, and how this uh, predisposes uh, women to diabetes and metabolic disease as well. So very pleased to have them uh, all here. And I think they'll just give very uh, short presentations uh, now about themselves and, and the things they do. Thank you very much, David, for the introduction. Um, Good morning, everybody, or evening for some of you, of course, looking at where you're all from. Um, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to be on this panel. Uh, as you can see, I'm the chair of a East Staffordshire and Surrounds Diabetes UK network. I'm 69 years of age. I've been a type 2 diabetic for about 15 years. It is controlled by tablet medication. Um, married with three adult children now, being as one of them's in his late 40s, four granddaughters, one grandson. But the interest in diabetes is that, apart from me, my wife has diabetes, type 2, but that has to be also insulin control. And I have a granddaughter who's now 19, and she's got type 1. And in fact, uh, at the beginning, we nearly lost her because we did not realise she'd got type 1. Um, I worked in industry, so I have nothing to do with health or the NHS, but I took early retirement. And after about two months of that, I got itchy feet, so I joined a local patient group, which, and I've been doing that ever since. But in 2013, I joined a colleague who had set up uh, a group in the Burton-on-Trent area in Staffordshire. And we became very, very big in the area. Uh, worked extremely well with Diabetes UK locally and also centrally. And we changed our names uh, in December last year and widened our, our sphere, what we do, and covered in all the other areas around us in South Derbyshire, et cetera, and became a patient network. Uh, our founder, unfortunately, retired from the group in May uh, and I be, the members voted me to be the chair, and uh, I've been doing that ever since. Now, through COVID, it's had a dramatic effect on people who have got diabetes. And so I made it my job to ensure that I kept in contact with all our members. And this would be email, text, and also over the phone. Uh, and started then having virtual group meetings. These meetings expanded to other groups as well, because I thought they may know of people in their families who have diabetes, and although they're not a member of our group, would most probably benefit from the information being sent out. Now, apart from that, I also, since 2013, when the clinical commissioning groups were set up in the UK, I was asked to sit on the patient board. I've done that now for six years, coming into my seventh year. And for three years now, I've been the, the vice chair of that board. I also sit on the district patient engagement group, which is where all the patient participation groups in the whole area come together as one group with representatives and I'm currently the vice chair as that as well. In terms of diabetes 
it gives me the chance to get the diabetes message to hire up within the NHS within our area, with the clinical commissioning group, the local hospitals, etc. And in fact, since about August, um, with the University Hospitals of Derby and Burton, uh, I was asked to sit on their group for the foot transformation to improve the foot care pathway. So I sit as a patient representative on that and the clinical commissioning group asked me to sit on their restoration and recovery group as we came into level three with the COVID. So hopefully my experience, and I'm the voice for the patient, and that is the main thing, is making sure the patient's voice is heard right the way through. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, uh, John, and thank you for being with us today. So Trish? Do you want to introduce yourself via slide format, please? So, hi everyone. Um, thank you very much for inviting me to be on this panel today. Uh, Caroline, if you can go to the next slide. So just to introduce myself, my name is Patricia Thomas and I am a member of the Centre for Systems Modelling and Quantitative Biomedicine. And my work really uh, revolves around the role and the link between obesity and type 2 diabetes. So I actually got into um, the field of diabetes uh, after working in the NHS and seeing really how prevalent the disease was and really the impact on the quality of people's lives uh, really made me want to go away and try, and try and find a cure, which is why many of us try and do it to improve the quality of life of these individuals. So my role, um, really, I'm a, what we call a basic scientist. So I look at, at the cellular level and I look specifically at how fats might be contributing towards the death and dysfunction of the cells of the pancreas, beta cells, which uh, secrete the hormone insulin. And despite the amount of people that have diabetes type 2 and the cost of the NHS, we still actually don't really understand the underlying cause of why these cells die. But we know that fatty acids may play a role with an obesity induced type 2 diabetes. So, Caroline, can I have the next slide? So my work really is to look at the machinery that the fatty acids might be affecting within beta cells and also specifically how fats of different sizes cross into the cell. And to address these questions, I use not only uh, wet lab experimental work, but I also myself and my colleagues within the SMQB use um, computational systems such as mathematical modeling, bioinformatics, um, and also um, artificial AI. So uh, we use different algorithms to look at questions and to make predictions about how these mechanisms might be working. And I look forward to your questions. Thank you very much. Excellent. Thanks, Trish. Uh, Alessandro? <clears throat> Hello. Um, uh, thank you very much. It's really a pleasure to be on this panel today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Alessandro Prete, and I'm a clinical research fellow working at the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research. And uh, since uh, 2018, I'm working towards a PhD, uh, uh, thanks to the funding of Diabetes UK. And I'm going to talk to you about briefly about the research that I do and how it can help uh, people with diabetes. If I can have the next slide. Uh, so my uh, research focuses on the adrenal glands, which are uh, glands, uh, small glands that are on top of the kidneys, which are a factory of hormones. And um, we know that uh, many adults, up to 5% of all adults, can have a lump in their adrenals, so a so-called adrenal tumor. Uh, we know that in the vast majority of cases, these lumps are non-cancerous. But since we are talking about glands that produce hormones, it's not uncommon that these lumps can produce um, an excess of the uh, stress hormone cortisol. And this condition is called the mild autonomous cortisol excess, MACE. We know from previous studies that too much cortisol can cause diabetes. And my research has shown that patients with MACE actually have a threefold increase of having diabetes if we compare it to patients with similar age, sex, and weight. If I can have the next slide, please. 
And uh, one of the reasons why this is relevant is first, because we are talking about a very significant share of the population, if we think that 5% of adults have a lump in their adrenals. And the second reason why this is important is because MACE is a potentially treatable disease. And the um, uh, treatment that we can offer these patients is surgery, that is the removal of the lump in their adrenals. Therefore, my hypothesis is that MACE is a very underestimated drive of diabetes in the adult population. And my research looks at uh, blood and urine of patients with or without MACE to look for markers that can predict the increased risk of having or developing diabetes with an aim to uh, improve the diagnosis of these patients and to offer a tailored management. And another part of my research focuses on uh, finding new, new treatments for these patients because uh, very often uh, surgery is not an option because they might be uh, uh, older or might have uh, health problems that contraindicate surgery. So I'm looking at different uh, treatment options for these patients. And lastly, I would like to say that uh, my research wouldn't be possible thanks to the support of Diabetes UK and thanks to the uh, support of the Institute where I work and all um, my collaborators in the uh, NHS and uh, all over the world. And uh, I'll thank you uh, everyone and I'd be happy to take any questions. Thanks Alessandro. So uh, finally Vika Alt will introduce herself and then we'll move on to the uh, uh, questions and answers. Okay, many thanks David, many thanks Caroline. So I'm Wiebke, Wiebke Alt, I'm the director of the Institute of Metabolism and Systems Research and uh, I'm both a researcher and um, a clinical specialist in hormones and diabetes. And you see our motto here, our vision statement, changing lives and advancing knowledge through innovative metabolism, maternal health and hormone research. And obviously diabetes is a major target of the research of our Institute. Could I have the next slide, please? Okay, so we do a lot of research in my group, which is funded by the Wellcome Trust on polycystic ovary syndrome. And what is polycystic ovary syndrome or for short PCOS? It was usually previously seen only as a condition that affects young women at reproductive age. And the main findings are male hormones, often with an increase in male pattern hair growth on the body, as well as irregular menstrual periods, which often lead to infertility. But we, what we know now is that PCOS is a lifelong metabolic disorder and that women with PCOS have a much increased risk of type two diabetes. Next click, please. So all these conditions, type two diabetes, hypertension, fatty liver disease and cardiovascular disease are increased in women with PCOS. Next slide, please. So we are currently undertaking a, a study, the DAISY PCOS study, to look at this in more detail because um, the link to metabolic disease has been previously overlooked. And PCOS is a completely prevalent condition, so which affects at least 10% of women and among South Asian women, possibly 15% um, of women in the UK and worldwide. So the DAISY PCOS study examines the link between male hormones and metabolic risk in disease. And we currently recruit to this study. So you see the website link there and you are very welcome to contact us if you have PCOS and are too interested in participating. Next slide, please. One important part is uh, of the DAISY PCOS research program is empowerment of patients. And we got from the Wellcome Trust an additional public engagement grant which actually um, has enabled us, um, supported and led by Caroline to kick off a DAISY PCOS patient leadership program. And you see here a screenshot from our first meeting a few weeks ago. This is a year long um, program where patients with PCOS will undergo leadership training so that they can inform others about the metabolic risks that come with PCOS. Many thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much, everybody, for introducing um, your excellent work. So what we're going to do now is convene the panel as a whole. 
And I'm going to kick off um, by asking um, a couple of questions and then we'll, we'll hand it over um, to the audience. So basically, if you have a question, we have the question and answers app. If you ask it via there, uh, then I'll be able to put that towards uh, the panel on your behalf. So um, I think really um, the major question is, um, what do you wish people knew about diabetes or your own diabetes research? Nobody. Okay. I take this one on then. I can. I'm happy to answer this. Happy yeah, to John. John. John's got his hand up. <laughs> oh God. Um. Yes, I give a bit of thought to this one, and I asked a few questions, and I, I took based on the history of people I know as well, what they used to say to me. And some of the biggest things are, is that they wish that people didn't think they were different, for one, uh, understand them and the condition. There will be mood swings, there will be tiredness, there will be medication issues in the, in the use of. And the cause is maybe not necessarily due to bad eating habits. It could be family history, it could be an, 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 if, whichever ethnic origin you are, sorry about that, got ran the wrong word then. Um, it's a daily challenge. We do need support, we do need understanding. Don't be judgmental. And some of that also goes to the, uh, the medical profession who are treating these people. Um, Everyone's situation is different. Everyone, everyone who's got diabetes, not everybody with diabetes is the same. So you can't treat everybody the same. You should listen to your patient and take on board what they're thinking and what it's their body. They know exactly what's going on within their body. They need some help steering things the right way. Um, so they don't want to be labelled. And the other thing, which I think is very important for people, and it gives a bit of confidence, I think, to people who are newly diagnosed, is it doesn't limit your abilities have, with having diabetes. And some examples, which I tend to quote is, and I'm sorry, some of these are sport related. You've got England's rugby international, Henry Slade, who's playing this afternoon. He's got type 1 diabetes. You've got Gary Mabbitt, who used to be a Tottenham Hotspur footballer, and he used to take insulin at half time, but it didn't stop him being very successful. The big one, of course, you've got Steve Redgrave, you know, and that didn't stop him at the age of 35 when he got diagnosed and being able to still go and win gold medal. So it doesn't stop you. And then if you like, we've got Theresa May, who was the first world leader who was diagnosed with type one after initially thinking it was type two. So you can, you can see that you may have diabetes, but it doesn't necessarily stop you. You just need people to listen to you. Thank you. Great, thanks, John. I think you touch upon a really important topic uh, there actually, which is quite close to all our hearts, is that you know diabetes is, is, is biological. It, it's nobody's fault. It occurs because of, of interactions between your genes and the environment. Yet, um, you know, maybe because of media portrayal and in, in history, it, it's, it can be viewed negatively and, and individuals can be stigmatized. I mean, you wouldn't say somebody with cancer, it was their fault, right? Um, whereas that, that is kind of, um, you know, where the media was going at one point. I think we've done a very good job about changing uh, that stigmatization. And actually it's important as well, um, you know, for the research funding. I mean, if you look at the funding diabetes receives, uh, compared to, for example, uh, cardiovascular, uh, heart disease research, cancer research, it's, it's very much smaller despite diabetes really being a pivotal kind of hub disease, which then can lead to all these diseases. So education is key, destigmatizing is key. And, and I think that's all our responsibilities as well to, to try and engender that. Um, I think Trish had a hand up. If you could give us a quick answer, Trish, because it'll be I'll yeah. some of the audience ones next. 
just to echo that, I mean, my, my research is around obesity related type two diabetes. And the question that I'm always asked is, well, can't people just eat less or, and it's just not that easy. It's a very, very complex system. I and mean, with obesity, where you have the rewiring of the brain and the change of the endocrine system with increasing adipose tissue, that actually we do need to address the stigmatism that goes with it. Yeah, and, and I think that this goes through, I mean, if you read the scientific literature, for example, uh, I cringe every time I, I, I see, you know, the phrase diabetic, um, you know, diabetic condition and so forth. And certainly as a reviewer, I always make people correct this. And I think journals need to, you know, certainly get on top of this. So there's many things we can all individually do um, to help with that. So I'm, I'm going to open this up to the audience because we've got some great questions uh, coming in. So uh, Kiki A um, says that regarding the research on insulin and fat, is there any evidence to suggest that the workings are different depending on whether it's a trans saturated or unsaturated fat? So I know who's going to be able to answer this and it's not me. Um, so I, I'm going to take a guess that it will be Trish. So yeah, we are looking into the role of the different types of fats and also um, how big or small those polyunsaturate, monounsaturate and saturated fats are. And we actually find that the fats that are detrimental to beta cell health are those saturated fats which have more than 16 carbons. So the, the really big saturated fats are the ones that are detrimental. And actually we're finding some really interesting things with the really big mono and saturated fats that they actually don't harm the beta cell and they can actually protect the beta cell from the toxic effects of the saturates. So far, we've only seen this really in animal models. This has not been shown in humans, but it's certainly an avenue that we're going down. Excellent. And, and I think it's always worth noting that there are healthy fats and unhealthy fats. Um, yeah, most definitely. They are <laughs> a very small population that are unhealthy. And actually, fats get a really bad name, but they are yeah. vital for you, to, for, your, for you to be healthy and living. So, yeah. Exactly. Um, Gabby, quickly, yes. Yep. Can I just add a little bit? So, so it's not just the fats that we consume, it's also how our fat cells work. Our fat cells are actually really important in terms of communicating with other tissues, including to the islets of Langerhans, to make them work properly. So, for example, one of my recent uh, bits of work looked at a gene that increases risk of type 2 diabetes. And when you delete this gene from fat cells, the fat cells stop working properly and they don't process fat properly. And the signaling to the pancreas then is disturbed and the pancreas also stops working properly. So fat is actually really important. Don't stigmatize fat because actually they do have have a really important function as well oh yeah yeah i mean you know you 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 need fat cells um yeah. and um you know they're 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 the depot for, for your fats and, and it's the overspill that causes a lot of the problems according to a lot of the work so from a, an anonymous attendee i think this is quite a, a a relevant question all things considered and i think john and alessandro are probably best place to answer this but due to pandemic how can we encourage or monitor patients to adhere <laughs> The medications and this is critical because appointments are getting cancelled things are getting uh, reprioritized yet people with diabetes are more susceptible to developing covid right so uh, john has worked on the front line he's been on the covid wards and he also treats patients with diabetes so he will have a very good answer yeah so we're in a really strong position uh, at the moment in terms of some of the technological platforms with diabetes about how we support and monitor and provide input to, to our patients that need it. And in one, one such example, perhaps, is uh, in one of our standard gestational diabetes clinics uh, in, in an afternoon, we would typically have between 30 and 40 uh, pregnant women all crammed into a very small waiting room, uh, waiting to see multiple different clinicians. Now, clearly, during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, which is obviously sadly ongoing, that is not at all appropriate because of the risk to the women of contracting COVID-19, either from the clinicians or from other patients in that waiting environment. So what we now do, uh, more, well, we were doing this previously, but we're now doing it more than ever, is we're using lots of digital platforms and there are multiple different platforms available, but we predominantly use something called Diasend where patients can upload their <clears throat> self-monitoring of their home blood glucose to this platform. We can review it remotely and we can speak to these people on the phone. Clearly in the case of pregnant women with gestational diabetes, there is still some need for face-to-face -face time, whether that be additional scans of the developing uh, fetus, et cetera, amongst other things. But certainly the use in technology in diabetes has changed enormously by COVID-19. And some of the changes have been positive, actually. And some of the things that we've been done are positive. And certainly lots of patients find it very, very helpful. 
there will always be a group of patients who find the uptake of technology and the virtual world can be difficult and troublesome. That might relate to access to technology. It might relate to socioeconomic status or baseline level of education or language. So whenever we talk about technology and how useful it is for monitoring patients, we always need to caveat it um, with saying that it's certainly not for everybody. And that's certainly what we've also found in some of our uh, use in using technology to support patients living with obesity as well outside of diabetes. So really great to use technology, but but clearly not for everybody, but certainly a lot of the technological changes we've made will be here to stay in the long term and we hope will be for the better. Yeah, I mean, I, th I think that's a key point it is that the technology, just looking at my own father, um, you know, when he started monitoring glucose, you know, to, to where we are now, um, it's, it's changed dramatically. And then having said that, the, the, the technology, you know, my, my dad struggles to kind of use his skybox, but has no issue uh, with, with, you know, Bluetooth and, and remote uploading of his blood glucose levels. So, you know, people are keen to adopt it and, and, you know, it needs to be as simple as possible to allow that to happen. But on the flip side, like you say, John, um, you know, the, the, you know, we need to be realistic that this won't be for everybody either. So um, that's really good to, to hear that. Um, does anybody else have anything to say about that? Alessandro. <laughs> Yeah, another point that uh, I would like to make uh, to echo also uh, John's uh, words is that, like, I think that COVID that really put in the spotlight the importance of uh, having a living with a diagnosis of diabetes. Because my impression is that now that we are into a epidemic of diabetes, the more it becomes prevalent, the more unfortunately it becomes sort of normalized. So the perception the, that the general public has of the problem is that it's so common that probably it's not as important as, uh, as someone uh, might think. And I, I think we all agree on that. But uh, COVID has really shown that patients with diabetes have a significantly high risk of morbidity and mortality. And hopefully this will change the attitude towards uh, uh, living with uh, a, di a diagnosis of diabetes. Yeah, uh, that, I very much hope so. I mean, you know, the diabetes, and we've sort of had these discussions frequently, it, it's kind of a non-emotive disease because, you know, we, we are quite good at treating it, but not, you know, completely. And it's something that's kind of, uh, you know, be reinforced over many years. So I, I think post-COVID, this is going to take a real reassessment about the role of, of, of diabetes and in, in how we're able to deliver our general healthcare services because it impacts upon everything. Um, and, you know, Diabetes UK have certainly um, sort of been funding reactively projects uh, surrounding uh, COVID and diabetes. So um, talking about that, um, we have a question from uh, John Terry in South Birmingham, um, not the footballer, um, might be the footballer. Um, there are many different aspects to diabetes research. How does Diabetes UK prioritise areas for research funding? I think this, this is a really important question and I'm going to send that straight to Elizabeth because I know they discuss this frequently. And thanks for the question, John. It's a, it's a great question. Um, as you know, there's, there's never enough funding for all the brilliant ideas and all the need. I mean, you know, John Bridges talks about the, you know, the, the need for real, really understanding individuals and understanding the individual experience of diabetes. Everybody's different and that complexity. Um, so there's so much more work to, to do. But to answer your question, we have two approaches. One is for all the brilliant ideas that come to us, David Adams may mention at the beginning that he chairs a committee for us, which oversees all of our work. And we go through, we ask people internationally, what are the best ideas? We ask people with diabetes to prioritize those ideas for us and we fund those ideas. But also thinking more <clears throat> perhaps strategically, we have groups called diabetes research steering groups where we bring together, I mentioned before, people with diabetes, researchers and clinicians to really think about, you know, where are those gaps? Where are the unmet need? Where if we got together and did more work collaboratively together, we could make more impact. And increasingly we're trying to work in partnership with others to really shine lights and focus on these areas. I've mentioned uh, eating disorders. We've just got a call out at the moment about implementation of, of, of different approaches to remission. So there's, there's lots we can do, <clears throat> excuse me, and it's about as 
uh, understanding the condition more, understanding its complexity, but also then focusing and helping the, everybody to work together to really make more progress because there is huge urgency and COVID as we've already touched on has really highlighted that. I hope that answers your question, John. Um. Thanks, Elizabeth. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that answers it uh, fully. I, I've seen that David's um, camera has re-illuminated, so I'm, I'm sure he'll want to say something on this as well. Yeah, thank, thanks, David. I mean, just just to say that that coming in sort of as an outsider chairing the, 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 the research committee at Diabetes UK, I've been so impressed. I'm involved in several funding bodies and charities, but I'm so impressed with how carefully they think uh, around their research strategy and particularly you know the involvement of uh, people with diabetes and patient groups and carers in planning that strategy and that's really that's really important it's very much a, very much a partnership and that that comes across when you're involved with the with the charity so I'm happy to sing their praises at any uh, at any opportunity I even ran a half marathon for them so that shows how uh, how highly I think of them <laughs> Thank you, David. <laughs> <laughs> that is high praise indeed. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that, you know, I, I think that's really key, and 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 certainly with Diabetes UK, it is the involvement of of the stakeholders in the decision making process, and that was quite unique at the time, and is now sort of being taken on, you know, even by some more of the government funding um, bodies, and and I think that's really pivotal because as a researcher, um, you know, you want to know that what you're doing um, is impacting or, or has been influenced by, by the stakeholder uh, or the patient themselves. And the stakeholders could be various depending on what you're doing. Um, so we, we have a question um, uh, from um, Marie. Um, and I think this again is relevant to some very recently funded research from, from Diabetes UK. So I'm thinking about the direct trial here. Will it be possible to stop medication for diabetes uh, if the patient seriously follows uh, diet and, and lifestyle uh, modification? So, uh, John, yeah. Yeah, I'm very happy to take this one. And just to be clear in my answer to the question, it very much depends on the type of diabetes that we're talking about, as well as the stage of the illness. And it's really crucial, I stress that. Clearly, patients with type 1 diabetes um, are going to need insulin, and that's going to be required uh, long term. Um, in the example of people who live with type 2 diabetes, particularly those who have had their type 2 diabetes diagnosed within the last few years and perhaps who aren't uh, currently requiring insulin in the management of type 2 diabetes, it's become increasingly clear through very impressive published research as well as ongoing research, and you've heard from the, about the research call targeting the remission of type 2 diabetes that's come out from Diabetes UK, that it's really important that we do target remission in patients with type 2 diabetes. Now that particularly relates to people with comparatively early onset diabetes, typically within the last five or six years, and typically to patients usually who are not requiring insulin, the self-management of their diabetes. But obviously the direct study, which I'm not involved with, but obviously have read very carefully and very excited by, has shown you know, very impressive data in terms of the remission of type two diabetes in a very carefully selected patient group um, up to two years of duration. But of course, it's really important to say that that is, and I think there's a question about very low energy diet and total diet replacement, a couple of questions down. That was a dietary strategy that uses a total diet replacement product uh, down to 825 kilocalories a day in the, in the direct study. And whilst that might be an attractive option for some people with type two diabetes, you know, it won't be uh, an option uh, for everybody or it may not appeal to everybody. But certainly the fact that the NHS is looking to roll out that program to 5,000 people nationally with type 2 diabetes as a large pilot and clearly that Diabetes UK have got their new remission call. You know, I guess I always caveat my answers because I know I'm speaking to a patient group, but I think we're in quite an exciting time for looking at remission of type 2 diabetes. And I would also say that there is no one solution fits all. And that's reflected in the Diabetes UK funding call. What is right for one person may not be right for another. So whilst a total diet replacement, meal replacement product might be attractive to some people, 
using whole food might be more attractive to others. And clearly there's lots of research around carbohydrate composition of individual diets in particular, and around things like low carbohydrate diets. So there are potentially lots of options. And as we always say, when I talk about diets, the diet that works for the person in front of you that they can afford uh, and tolerate and maintain is always the most attractive and sensible option. Uh, but I think we're in a really exciting time and I'm very happy to take that question. Well, thanks, John. And, um, you know, there is a bit of, you know, it, it's a yin yang because as you say, th these diets, um, you know, have, have been pitched as being quite revolutionary, but the reality is, is we don't want to make patients who can't accomplish this feel bad about that because the reality is is that type 2 diabetes is incredibly heterogeneous disease um, you know we have people from all over the world here and, and depending on the healthcare setting it, it just you know won't be possible to, to deliver these kind of interventions and you know certainly following twitter there's, there's nothing like talk of low calorie or low carbohydrate diets to get you know everybody kind of um, sort of all, all kind of furious about various things. So I think we need to be very careful about how, how we pitch this and, 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 you know, the success of this, which is something I know that Diabetes UK are doing. So, you know, on the flip side of this, we have a great question from uh, anonymous attendee. Um, and um, th this attendee has um, long-term PCOS uh, and obesity and, you know, decades of restrictive um, eating and weight loss. Um, you know, j j just for that to be regained and, and, and rebound with the associated stigma, um, guilt and so forth. And, and they want to know, you know, how would you see the role of low calorie diets in, in, in not just this, but, but, but on the background of obesity and other diseases. So I think the Vika um, is, is best place to, to, to take this on. Um, many thanks, David. Um, yeah, I think it is very important. Um, this is exactly the same as we just talked about type 2 diabetes and obesity in general with regard to the stigma. Yeah, like PCOS women um, have been genetically selected over centuries to make good use of food. I explained to them always that they are guaranteeing the survival of the human race in war and hunger because they can survive very well and still be fertile with little food. But in our times where food is everywhere, it is extremely difficult for them to maintain a normal weight. Yeah. And I think it is absolutely important to be realistic of um, um, weight uh, loss and diets. Yeah. It is a, a big achievement already if patients maintain their weight rather than lose it. Yeah, it is, and it is from a clinical experience, obviously radical diets that cannot be maintained as a permanent lifestyle, yeah, will fail because the patients cannot maintain this long-term and therefore regain the weight and that makes them even more frustrated. Yeah, if they look at their lifestyle and try to make the best, this is a big achievement and that will avoid that they worsen. But I'm sure that John and also Trish can also comment further on diets. Cool. If we can have a couple of brief answers, because we've got a couple of other great questions I'd like to put towards the panel. So, uh, Trish, do you want to? Yeah, so just briefly say that they've actually, I mean, evidence just to back up what, what Jonathan and Vibka have both said, that actually weight cycling is actually can be actually worse for you than just maintaining a steady weight. And just to impress with a lot of these diets as well, that they are when diet is being delivered as a treatment, it's, it's under the guidance of dietetics and under your doctor's advice. So if you are thinking about going or seeking more information on these diets, do seek medical medical uh assistance on it rather than just going for a crash under a thousand calorie diet yeah i mean this is the key this is why direct is so successful because it is a joined up healthcare prescription intervention and and you know you can monitor it monitor progress and so forth um, but definitely do you know never change your diet without the advice of um you know a healthcare professional john very quickly yeah what one line just on stigma if i may um, whenever we lose weight, and certainly this has happened when I have periods of weight loss, people tell me well done or, or you look well or that kind of comment. And actually, there is a flip side to that kind of comment and it can be quite unhelpful. 
Um, because of course, you know, as with lots of interventions around weight loss, you know, all interventions around weight loss are invariably associated with a degree of weight gain and regain over time. So I would just ask everybody in a, you know, uh, viewing to just think very carefully about how they interact with people uh, who are living with obesity, who are going through periods of weight cycling, uh, and just make sure that we don't use anything that could be stigmatizing or potentially harmful to try and support people in their continued efforts, uh, you know, at kind of weight management. Yeah, uh, again, it, it's just pure biology, you know, just in the same way that you get old, um, you know, these things will happen, right? So, um, you know, um, you know, should not be stigmatized for that. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to get through a couple more questions just before we wrap up. Um, there's one uh, which I think is particularly topical. So this is from uh, Winston, um, and it's about a link between COVID-19 and type 1 diabetes. And, and Winston's healthy 14 year old son was recently diagnosed with type one diabetes after suffering from uh, COVID and having no prior history of, of, of diabetes. Um, so no, very, very sorry to hear uh, that Winston, but I, I can kind of um, begin um, to answer that. And um, the answer is yes, there is a link between COVID-19 infection and diabetes. And um, the mechanisms are not known. We, we know that quite often for type 1 diabetes, uh, a viral infection will often precede development of type 1 diabetes in an apparently normal uh, individual. And this can be both adult and, and, and younger individual. Um, COVID-19 is, is, is tending to cause type 1 diabetes in older patients, which is relatively un unusual. And there's a lot of debate over how it's doing this, but they believe that the receptor um, um, for um, COVID-19 and the way it gets into the cell is expressed in your pancreas. So it somehow is uh, kind of drawn to the pancreas where then it will cause uh, an autoimmune uh, attack upon your um, beta cells, which is kind of, you know, the classic presentation of type 1 diabetes. Now, I must caveat, I'm not clinically qualified. I'm just following um, the research and it is very debated at the moment because, of course, um, you know, the research samples are quite difficult to access with this being such a new disease. I mean, anybody who's clinically qualified um, and maybe actually seen this can, can comment. Um, so I'm thinking John or, or, or Alessandro. Yeah, sa sadly seen this quite a lot, actually, as, as um, at the first presentation of patients with COVID who require hospitalisation. Clearly, everybody who's admitted to hospital has a blood sugar checked as part of that admission. And there's an awful lot of new diagnosis of diabetes in patients who are presented with COVID, which clearly re reflects the emerging mechanisms that David has mentioned. And in particular, we're seeing lots of people as well who've had uh, well-controlled, stable controlled type 2 diabetes for many years without particular incident on stable medications who come in with a, a, a diabetes emergency, something called diabetic ketoacidosis, which would be more typically, although not exclusively seen in type one diabetes. And lots of those patients, are clearly everybody's being swabbed for COVID-19. And invariably those patients that present with DKA, diabetic ketoacidosis, who have type two that's known about, will turn out to be COVID-19 positive because of the mechanisms that you've said. So we're certainly seeing this you know, a lot and quite commonly at the moment. I mean, I mean, it, 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 it's a pure association at the moment. You know, we can't tie the two things together in the same patient because, you know, you could develop type 1 diabetes. Certainly of course. Yeah. 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 yeah, and there's always a degree of coincidence. Um, but I have to say, I don't think I've seen so much new presentation of diabetes or so much diabetic ketoacidosis in people outside of type 1 diabetes than I've seen, you know, within the last few months. But clearly that's anecdotal and it's not supported yeah. entirely I mean, by data. The, the, the association um, it is strong, Ca causation it is not strong. So around the world, uh, similar increases are being seen. I mean, I think it's worth noting, Wisdom, that, you know, obviously for, for you and your son, this is um, a bit of a traumatic time. But, you know, as, as John Bridges uh, pointed out, um, you know, with examples of Steve Redgrave and Henry Slade will play today. And um, now with type 1 diabetes, um, you know, you, you uh, will go on to lead a, a normal um, lifespan, especially with all the innovations around constant, uh, continuous glucose monitoring uh, and pumps, etc. So, um, you know, it, it's nothing to be worried about. And, and particularly Diabetes UK are extremely good at supporting uh, patients through, through the helplines on, on this as well. Um, I think John probably wants to quickly comment as well. Yeah, <clears throat> the talk in nowadays, um about not just COVID, but the condition long COVID. Um, 
is there a possibility that people may develop through the long COVID stage diabetes, which might not show in the initial stage of COVID? Just want to throw that one out to see what the clinicians think. I, I guess at the moment it's probably quite early to put the two things together. Yeah. My assumption is, is because of the timelines involved with development of type 2 diabetes, which tends to be a little bit uh, longer, obviously, than, than type 1, um, we'll begin to see if there's any association over the next two to three years. I mean, can you quickly comment, um, John or Alessandro? Alessandro? Yeah, I totally agree with you. I think uh, we are going to see it in the next few years, uh, whether there's a, a, a clearly a, a causal link between COVID and the new onset of uh, type 2 diabetes. But yes, as John Jonathan was saying previously, it's really striking the amount of severe cases that we see now coming through the doors of the hospital. Thank, thanks, Isaac. I think Elizabeth um, has a hand up as well. Yeah, sorry, because of my screen. I don't know whether you can see my hand. Um, just to let you know that we're working um, with people across the country on, on, a, on a new study, which is, is called uh, FOSS-COVID or post-hospitalisation COVID. And it will be monitoring, I think, 10,000 people um, to try, try and answer the, just such a question as that. And I will feed that question in, into that, to that study, because I think that's the type of um, questions from people with diabetes we, we need to be addressing through these types of studies. So thank you, John. Yeah, it, it, it's, it's a fantastic question. And, um, you know, it, again, it, it wraps up diabetes as being a central, you know, issue with, with all these things. And, you know, um, for everybody out there, it just shows how severe COVID is. And certainly long COVID is now a well-recognised manifestation and a clinical syndrome in its own right, which is different to the acute uh, COVID that you'll see all over the papers and something that we'll have to deal with um, over many years. So I think we've got time, have we Caroline, for one last question? I think so, David, and it would be great just to, to go around each of the panelists maybe just at the end, kind of get a wrap up sentence from everybody before yeah. we sign off. So um, the, the last question is from uh, Jurek. I hope I'm pronouncing um, the name okay. Um, and then this is really around uh, the genetics of type 2 diabetes. So I'm kind of looking at myself and, and Gabby on this one. Um, but Jerick says, I have type 2 diabetes and the chances that my son and daughter to have it is like 90%. Um, so I, I, I think, first of all, it's, it's probably, um, you know, to, to, to look at this 90%, right? So, so Gabby, if you have type 2 diabetes, um, from just, you know, a conventional kind of risk allele origin, right, to speak technically. Um, you know, what are your views on this? So there is a, a component of genetics, but there's also a component of the environment as well. So the data that we get from the genome-wide association studies, which is the big studies which look at the contribution of genetic variations to type 2 diabetes risk, indicates that there is a risk, but actually doesn't explain the complete picture and that there's always an interaction with the environment that that seems to to lead to the disease itself. So yes there there is a potentially a genetic uh genetic uh component of this but then there's also a hard, large component of the, the environment which can be very difficult to quantify. So for example when we talk about inheritance we frequently think about the genes which are the nuts and bolts but we also inherit a lot of habits within our within the family environment which could also potentially be, be be causing or leading to to diabetes. So so it's difficult to quantify this, but the the take home message I suppose is the bit of both. So so there's a bit of um, trying to manage it so that you you at least delay onset of disease as much as possible, assuming there's a genetic risk. But then there's there's also the fact that if there is a genetic risk, it's it's, it's useful to know that 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 that's there so that you know how to manage. So it. yeah, I, I, I think the key key messages are that type two diabetes is not really hereditable uh, hereditable. Uh, disease um, that, um, you know, if you don't have a defined genetic cause of it, so this is a very strong presentation uh, caused by what we call monogenic disorders. Um, yeah. If you had all the the, the, the kind of risk genes in your body, it would only confer a 10% chance of developing type 2 diabetes. So pretty much we can confidently say that, that if your parents have type 2 diabetes, you're unlikely, um, you know, to develop it. And it's really all about maintaining you know, a healthy lifestyle with exercise and diet. Um, and, and, you know, I, I think as the generations, you know, go on and access to that, 
then that advice is different. That there's no reason to think that your children will develop type two diabetes. I mean, John touched upon gestational diabetes, and of course, I'm at risk of this. Um, you know, I was born a very large um, baby as a consequence of that. Um, but you know, there is a component that will influence your risk. But again, you have to take measures uh, against that, or you can take measures against that. So it's not something I'd worry about. So just in the interest of time, uh, I thought I'd go around the panel as Caroline suggested, and, and, and just get everybody uh, just to wrap up and, and, and provide us with some uh, concluding thoughts. So uh, if we start with John. Thank you, David. Um, the one thing I'd just like to say is today, as everyone knows, is World Diabetes Day. And one of the strap lines is one small act. Well, my small act I'd like to say is thank you. Thank you to the IMSR for arranging today and for Caroline and Faye. A big thank you to Diabetes UK for all the hard work they do and also for funding these research projects. For all my fellow panel members for the excellent work and dedication you give. And finally, to all the participants who have taken the time to be on this webinar today. Thank you so much. By working together, we will make life better. Thank you. That's great. Thank you, uh, John, for those um, words. And I think that's the key is that as, as researchers and clinicians, we love to engage, um, you know, through these webinars and with our stakeholders and the public, you know, we actually enjoy uh, doing um, these things. And it's really good to, to get advice and actually to be able to answer uh, questions um, as well, um, you know, with, with a nice, diverse, you know, basic and, and clinical uh, panel. So I'd like to thank everybody uh, for, for attending today, actually, and, and, and making this an amazing um, kind of, you know, question and answer process. So, uh, Gabby, any concluding thoughts? Uh, talk to us, I suppose. Sometimes when I tell people that I'm a, I'm a biochemist by training, they, they, they kind of think, oh, I can't really talk about this. But actually, I love talking about what my work. I will talk about it till the cows come home. So feel free, if you have any questions, talk to me and I'll always answer. Yeah, but be careful because if you ask a researcher to talk about the research, you're going to get stuck for about three hours whilst they bore you. <laughs> um, John? Yeah, th thanks for your time and thanks for such engaging questions. It's been a pleasure. I just encourage everybody when they think about diabetes to, to know your type and know exactly what you're talking about. Um, and, uh, and I think, you know, clearly that's really important in how we approach different types of diabetes. And I think I'd probably just end on that line. Yeah, I mean, the questions have been fantastic, you know, absolutely sort of bang on, um, you know, everything that, that, that we think about on a daily basis. And actually, it just made me think about how we kind of package up our diabetes strategy as well, um, you know, now and going forwards. So, Trish? So again, I'd like to thank everyone for coming. Um, patients are at the heart of everything we do, and um, it's great to have the opportunity to speak to you. I'd also like to thank Diabetes UK, who were actually the funders of my PhD, and everything they've done for me and for the patients with this condition. They're an amazing charity and an amazing resource for people that are wanting to seek further help. So thank you. Great. Thanks, Trish. I think, yeah, I mean, as, as many of us have, have been diabetes funded, or Diabetes UK funded, it's been really pivotal um, you know, for, for, for the work we do. And I think, you know, Diabetes UK uh, will quite often tweet, we're part of their research family. So, so once you're a member, you're always a member, you know, no matter how tough funding is, um, you know, and, and, you know, this will be tough going forward, but we'll come through the back end of that as well altogether. Um, so Elizabeth, on that note. Gosh, on that note, David, um, I've just found it really inspiring, as always, listening to the work that's going on in Birmingham and, you know, the real, you know, I can't emphasise enough the importance of collaboration that you exemplify. But I, I really want to thank John Bridges as well, because, you know, the amount of effort you put in, you know, bringing people together and that's absolutely vital for the work that we do. So, again, to thank all the 80 odd people that have joined from across the world. You know, we can't do it without you. And thank you very much. Yeah, it's great. Yeah. And, and particularly, John, I mean, you know, patients give us a voice, right? Um, and it's not always easy to access patients, um, you know, whether you're basic or clinical. So having, um, you know, people like you in these patient network and support groups is a really huge um, resource for us. Alessandro? Yes, I really want to thank everyone that joined us today because I um, mean, patients with diabetes and the general public are really at the heart of what we do. And, 
Um, I also want to thank Diabetes UK because it really is, is doing an excellent job in bridging uh, the communication between uh, researchers and the general public. Excellent. Vipka? I unmute myself um, and I'm very encouraged that several, obviously several women with PCOS and diabetes attended, which is excellent. Yeah, and that's something we are really aiming at because most women with PCOS are, do not know about the link to uh, type 2 diabetes. And this is something which we really aim at. And um, I'm obviously um, um, very glad and happy that uh, we could obviously showcase the links between clinical researchers and basic science researchers working together with patients here to answer important questions for diabetes. Many thanks. Thanks, Vicky. Yeah, and, and I think that's a critical point that you know, type 2 diabetes is a disease in its own right, but it can also be caused by other diseases as well. So we need to kind of think about this, not bracketed as, you know, kind of our conventional type 1, type 2, but how it presents at an individual patient level. Um, so quite personalised. And finally, um, um, David. Yeah, that just, I'm, I'm, I just put on the chat, I'm so proud that the college has been able to, um, to host such a fantastic event. Um, I've, I've really enjoyed it. I've, I've, I've learned a lot. I've been sitting in the background listening. Um, thank you all so much. And I think you know, John Bridges summed things up absolutely perfectly in his, in his comments. So thanks to everybody and thanks to, to all of the attendees who've, uh, who've joined as well. That's great. Thank you very much. And we, we will be running um, similar events again. Um, and, and we frequently run events based upon, you know, specifics of, of the research. So, I mean, finally, I'd just like to thank um, Caroline and Faye that have really enabled this. I mean, I, I'm, you know, I'm not great with Zoom um, and, and getting all this sorted is a really big task. We've been trying to get this sorted now um, for, for a couple of months. So really thank you uh, for helping us with, with this. And it just goes to show, you know, the importance of having, uh, you know, people uh, from a communications background as well helping with this. It's been really important to allow us to get our research out and to interact with the patients in public. And then finally, just thank you for everybody that's tuned in. I, I find it amazing, and this is the best thing about the, the, new, the new virtual world, is that we have people from across the globe who are able to attend. And it's really important for us that we reach as many people as possible because we might be based in the UK, but the diseases that we research, you know, they don't know borders or boundaries, okay? And it's really important for awareness of this. So on that note, I wish you all a very nice rest of weekend. Uh, sorry that we've overrun a bit. Um, there'll be certificates available as well if anybody needs them. Uh, I think uh, Caroline will provide further details on that and we'll put the recorded um, webinar up uh, and Q&A session uh, up on uh, either Twitter or, or our website. Again, Caroline will um, coordinate that. So uh, thank you all again and hope to rejoin uh, and give you an update uh, a year in the future. Take care.